Sup? We have pleased the youth's trademark. We're trying. Notice our green screen? Look what we did. Oh. Wait. meant to be perfect ever once not even once <laughs> to be fair that's usually my microphone and christine's now realizing the struggles i've had to go through it was mine and then you suddenly got it and we're like what's going on with my fucking microphone and so i took it back to make you feel better anyway is this fun yet you want to try again all right technical difficulties aside welcome we um we have Please the youths, they have informed us that things are good, that they like what, what we gave them. Some so of, far, A for effort. Some of them were very happy that we called them youths because they were in their 30s and said they prefer YouTube. So... Youth tube. I actually was going to say that. What? Episode, really? Yeah, I was like, I'm going to say that next episode. And then I was like, it's so terrible that I'm coming up with a bad pun in, I'll handle it. in advance. So I'm glad you just did it on a riff, like naturally. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm here for. Also, uh, I want to give a shout out to the person who made these sh the the shirt for me. It's apparently one of a set. Well, here's what happened. Um, we knew we were setting up a green screen today, which, by the way, here's our green screen. Welcome. Um, and both of us wore green. Yeah, it's pretty standard. So. Wait, listen, we're starting from the bottom. Still here. We're still stuck at the bottom. We, uh, so I was like, I'm sure I have one of your shirts somewhere and I have a collection of stuff. When I tra we travel, I bring a suitcase for all our like gifts and stuff. And so they end up in a big bat and a big, big suitcase, suitcase of mine. And so I found, and this was from our most recent trip. Yes. So, uh, a lot of people, well, it wasn't, where's it from? Atlanta. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Not Salt Lake, but like before that, one of our most recent trips. And so I have uh, one that says Eva, write that down. Mine's the only one in tie dye. That's nice. And, uh, uh, no, it's not. Yeah, huh? Yours is in tie dye? Yeah. Oh. They're all in tie dye. <laughs> all the other ones were in solid color, in different colors. Okay, maybe I'm misremembering. Listen, I remember when I see a good tie dye. I'll check later. But anyway, so I found this in my. I was trying to steal it, but I brought it out for M. So we'll see. Hopefully, that uh, we are not part of the green screen. Hopefully not. But who can say? Uh, this really is just like the beginning when we started the podcast and did not know what we were doing. And after a couple episodes, it started to become something really good. So <laughs> be patient. <laughs> this is round two of us on camera. Um, one day it's going to look really bitching. Just not yet. Yeah. Um, so far so good. We're really faking it with this green screen. It looks cool to me. It took us an hour and a half to set it up. Well, we were going to nail it to the wall and then we came up with a better idea to actually follow the instructions that came with it. Christina has a habit of nailing things to walls. Em thinks that I do, but really it's always Em's idea to do that. No, it's not. Listen, there, right here there's a curtain that uh, uh, Christine Do not up. say I, I nailed it to the wall. I didn't. She nails the rod to the wall okay, and then I, she hangs the curtain on incorrect. the rod. Incorrect. I hang... Listen, you guys are going to love this tip. You, <laughs> It is a good tip. Someone told me once you put big instead of like a command hook or whatever, you just put like a really thick nail and then you can rest the curtain rod on top of the nail. And that way you don't have to screw in a bunch of screws, mess up the wall. It's just a one little nail. To okay. be fair, it works. I'm like, I'm shitting on you, but you're right. At the same time, it works. But I just assumed since you're so willing and open-minded to do it with other things, why not do it with the green Listen, screen? I built every piece of furniture in this room, so you can leave me alone until you want to come here and build all my furniture. Then we can speak. Uh, firm pass. Okay. Welcome to, and that's why we drink, a paranormal and true crime podcast. Do you have any updates? Me? Um, my only update was that we've pleased the youths and I am pleased that they are pleased. All right. Um, I got nothing. Oh, so I wanted to mention we had an awesome time at our last show of the year. Yeah. Salt Lake. Uh, we did a double show, a double header, which was wow, wow, a lot. We're not used to that. No. Um, we did it once in Houston. Did we do it in Dallas too? Or that was no, two different just nights? only one time ever before this. And both times were a lot. Um, but we commend the people who came to the second show and stuck it out with us until like midnight. Oh my God. It was a wild ride. I had a blast. We had fun. Blast. Yeah, but it was definitely a long night. So to everybody who came to both or either one or to the late show, thank you. Um, we had a really good time and you guys brought so many presents and we were not expecting it. 
Oh. Uh, I mean, I was because I brought an empty suitcase. I wasn't expecting that many gifts. Everyone was very generous. Everyone was so nice. Uh, speaking of gifts, one specific person that sticks out in my mind brought uh, a gift from the grocery store they work at. <laughs> uh, basically, this person said, I work at a grocery store and we are we're doing inventory and we were cleaning out our back stock and I this happened- This is Noah, by the way. Noah said this. Noah then said, I found a petrified avocado to go with lemon and then handed it to us. Aww. And now we have two dried up mummified foods that our manager can be equally disappointed about. That I'm friends with and very close to. So now instead of just lemon, we've got lemon and avocado. Now I have a suitcase full of souvenirs and a petrified avocado. And I've got two reasons to hate Christine. <laughs> Only two? Wow. Lucky two me. in the grocery department. That's about <laughs> it. Thank you, Noah, for my petrified um, avocado. Lemon really needed a new cousin, so. I can't stand this. Anyway, here SOS. we are. We are uh, done for our touring for 2019 and it feels good because we are tired and we're ready to revamp our tour for like a new yes. season, a fresh new start. And we have said this before, but we want to keep hyping it up that our next tour is going to be a very different format. Oh so God, I'm so excited. We can't tell you anything. But it's going to be different. But I mean, so look what we're doing. We're building green screen. We're trying. We're trying so hard. Listen, you. You better come out to the next show as long as you're 18 older. Youth. Um, <laughs> as long as, like, you don't drink. As long as you're not legally a youth. Um, but yeah, uh, we're trying a whole bunch of new stuff. We've had a lot of ideas for a long time. And so uh, it seems like it's all coming. It's all happening at once. But we've had these thoughts for a while. And we just finally have the time now that we're not touring to kind of do as much as we can and we want to get as much done as we can before we're touring right. again so it seems like it's all coming out of nowhere but these have been things we've been working on behind the scenes for a while yes so and like our updated patreon and all this stuff mm -hmm. is like really new projects we've been thrown around ideas for a long time but finally they're actually happening yes very exciting stuff and uh we will say about the tour again one of our favorite things about next tour is that we are going to be releasing all the dates at one time. Oh yeah, so, so no stress. We said it before, but I just want to keep reiterating it because yep. someone's finding out for the first also, time. Also, right I know Em said no use, but most of our shows are all ages, so. Oh, they are. That's nice. I just like to upset the youths, I guess. I'm on your side because I'm cool and fun and hip. I like to confuse people. Yep, I know. I'm used to the comedy club scene. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Em's used to the. Sorry, Em's used to the comedy scene. Well, you wouldn't a, know about it, so. I'm used to being a professional comedian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I. Should we do this thing? Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm looking at my notes and I'm, I'm remembering how psyched I am actually. Oh, by the way, if you're here on YouTube, um, the thing, the thing is still going to happen. Apparently this camera auto shuts off at 29 minutes. Um, so just a heads up, there will be weird cuts that happen and that's, um, something apparently we can't stop. Nope. So sorry. We don't know what to do, and we don't. I can't imagine that you expect more from us than that. Yeah. So. Listen, this is never going to be perfect, and if you expect that, then you're in the wrong place. Well, after how many episodes, you should know <laughs> the shtick at this point is we don't know what's going on <laughs> any more or less than anyone else. So um, we're, we just happen to have a green screen in the camera now. In my head, they all see a green screen. I'm hoping I figured out how to put something on the green screen. Because in my head, I'm we like, see a green wall. Yeah, because in my head, I'm like, cool. They see like this big green background, and then I'm like, wait, that's not fun for wait, anyone. <laughs> ideally, they're actually not seeing the green screen. They're seeing a cool logo. But if you're seeing a cool logo, it's a green. It's working. If you're seeing a green screen, then the surprise. Surprise! Here's our green. We don't know screen. what we're doing. Yeah, but we know how to nail it to the wall. So, uh, all right. So my story. This, I almost said this year. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Bye, we're done. <laughs> Actually, this is the last show of 2019. Oh my god, our manager was with us in Salt Lake and I said something like, it's our last show. And he was like, it is not your last show. Yeah. I'm like, no, no, of the we year. We of this tour. He's like, you gave me a heart attack. I was like, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I, and then I, I was like, what do you think Em and I would do with our time? Like, we literally have nothing else to do. We just got decided to give up on the show, and we, but also get a green screen. We just want to talk at you always. That's literally all we care about doing. Since we like talking at you, Listen up now. This story is a UFO story. Okay. And it is supposedly uh, like the most popular UFO story in all of Europe. Wow. Thank you for caring. Oh, well, a uh, Geo came up on the. Oh. <laughs> well, how is this so much worse than the first one? I don't know. It's whatever, it's fine. Okay. Okay, so it is supposedly the um, 
most haunted, or no, not the most haunted, stupid. The most famous UFO story of all of Europe. So, Fascinating. It is, I think. Um, um, what country won, won this prize? Uh, the... I was gonna try to make a funny joke, but it wasn't gonna be funny. Um, Sounds hilarious. <laughs> that was Italy. Italy is the answer. I was gonna say like the home of pizza or something stupid. Okay. Ha ha ha! That was funny. <laughs> I can't stand you. <laughs> so anyway, likewise, here, here is the story of the abduction of Pierre Fortunato Zanfretta. What the fuck? Um, I like how you say it with a question mark. Like we're all gonna. Well, someone out there cheering. is gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my favorite! Yeah, maybe Zanfred is listening to this in Italian. So, this oh, is... Oh, the home of pizza? The home of pizza is where he's oh, from. Oh, okay. Um, his, so, I just call him Zanfreda for the entire uh, story. I'm not going to call him the, the full name, just his last name. Got it. I also called him Z pretty often. Oh, so Z! If that's that, cute. If that accidentally slips up, I apologize. I like it. Um, all right, so I'm just going straight into his abduction. There's... Let's do it. He apparently has been either abducted or had encounters with the supernatural up to 11 times in a matter of three years. Uh-oh. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to go through the main ones. So 11 times. So this is his first encounter, which was in 1978 in December, on December 6th. Zanfreda is a 26 year old security guard and he's working in a village near, well, Genoa. <laughs> already you got you never google these things no no genoa yes cool i just wanted to keep calling it genovia and i knew that was wrong i, I thought maybe that's where you're we going or geneva but then i realized we're not in switzerland right we're still in italy N yeah we're still in italy okay you're correct though. but i just keep seeing genovia in my head princess of genovia <laughs> zanfretta prince of, of genovia. genovia okay so Oh, God, the dream. The 26-year-old prince, Zanfreda, is also a security guard, and he's working in a village near Genoa. And, uh... Or Genoa? Jean away? <laughs> it might be Genoa, sorry. It might be Genoa, actually. Like a hard G. It's not. Uh, so while he's working in the village, it's cold and snowy, so let's remember that. Okay. Um, he's driving by a, a country house that no one's currently living in. It's an empty country house. Um, and his car stops dead. The, everything, his engine, the radio, his car is just kaput. Womp womp. Uh, so when he gets out, he also looks into the house that's currently not being lived in, and he sees four lights in the house. Wait, and like, who's out? Just like a in random the, In the abandoned, he's like, he's a security guard, so he's just driving by and oh, passing oh, oh, oh. by homes. Okay. Uh, surveilling the, the area, the maybe? The neighborhood? Yeah. Okay. Uh, of Genovia. Of Genovia. <laughs> he's not the prince he, of Genovia. He, he he's cares actually his, cares a lot. security guard of Genovia. Not his <laughs> a little that bit. Would, so is he Joe? Oh my god, no. Just, was, well, yeah, I guess he would be security is guard. Is he dating Julie Andrews? Zinfreda? What's going on here? Damn. Uh, big day for Zinfreda. And abducted. abducted by Ailey. This is Ooh. quite. This is like the sci-fi version of Princess Diaries. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Trademark. Yep. Don't steal that from me. Uh, so, the Siffy Diaries of Genovia. The Siffy. That's what M's dad calls Sci-Fi Channel, in exactly. case you're not aware. Yeah. Loving Of the inner workings of M's father's He mind. calls me often to tell me he's watching the Siffy Network, and I never know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, now we do. So, he saw four lights in this house that nobody should be in. He got out to investigate because he thought maybe there were burglars, and as a the security guard of Genovia, he was really excited to, you know, kick some ass. Sure. Got out of his car, is sneaking behind the house to try to catch them off guard, but he feels something grab him from behind. Uh. He turns around and he sees, quote, an enormous green, ugly, frightful creature, no less than 10 feet tall. Uh oh. Okay. I lost my spot. I thought you were gonna no, make I'm a just really gonna dramatic blow statement your mind. about how it looked like me. I was waiting for that. Well, I did think that when I got to Ugly Frightful Creature, but... Yeah, we did that a lot last episode and seemed to have a great time with it, so... I love calling Christine an Ugly Frightful Creature. Uh, yeah. So, anyway, he saw Christine standing behind him. <laughs> you were to just... be fair, I apparently grabbed him, which is, like, not cool. But I, that's true. He, he didn't consent, and not he cool. is a prince slash security guard. <laughs> we're not sure. <laughs> so, Zenfreda runs off, naturally, because Christine is behind him. I would run, too. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I shouldn't have even said anything. Uh, and so then all of a sudden he notices above him a large, flat, triangular form with blinding lights that are bigger than the house itself. Uh-oh. 
um, hissing at him, and he feels this intense heat. And that's M coming in hot. An intense heat from the Listen, ceiling. Magnetic, raw. Yes. Sure. Just that's what I meant. Heat from all corners. Gross. <laughs> No, thank you. I would run away too. So he got to his car and this was at a uh, little after midnight. It was like 12, 15. He radios the operator back at like security headquarters. I don't know what this thing is called, but I'm going to call it like security. star command or something. Sure. Uh, so the operator answers. His name's Carlo. He later act does testify that um, Zenfreda was not sounding like himself. He sounded really erratic and really panicked. Um, apparently he kept hearing Zenfredo on the radio go, my God, are they ugly? Which is exactly what I say about Christine. Well, that's pretty mean though. I mean, that's what he's focusing on. They're ugly. Like, can you imagine if you're being attacked by a swarm of aliens and all you can think about is, is how their ugly. looks? I mean, I, I, that's not a way to win them over either. Like, yeah. Oh, please don't attack me. You hideous beast. <laughs> right. I can't okay. even look at you. You're being vomit. <laughs> I mean, damn. Imagine if you just looked at them and went, woof. Like, oh, no. Absolutely not. Yikes. Your life must be tough. So the operator asked, uh, apparently Carlo is a homie because he immediately just assumed these things were aliens and like didn't even question it. He went. So it literally is you and me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If I were to call you and be like, oh my God, are they ugly? You'd be like, it's an alien. The aliens? Yes. So the operator said, are they human and are they assaulting you? And. uh a human. Yeah, he just jumped on board. He was like, whatever's going on. It's so ugly. So Based ugly. on your description, it could not be a human being. Oh, my. Uh, and Zanfreda says back into the radio, no, they aren't men. They aren't men. And then the communication totally shut off, like the radio. So Carlo's like, oh, this guy's getting possessed by aliens or something. So I'm going to call security guards. <laughs> Carlo, listen, he's the main, main guy. He's really, on, he jumped on board way quicker than most people in these stories. At a time of crisis, I appreciate how quick to being open to the situation he was. Mm -hmm. He didn't fight anyone on it. He was like, if you're saying they're not human, then they're not. Yeah. Um, so he called out security guards to go looking for him. Uh, they found Zinfreda at the house, the same house, an hour later at 1.15 in the morning. He was lying on the ground. And when he saw the guards, he was freaking out. His eyes were bulged. He tried to pull a gun on them. He did not recognize them. And these are guards that he's known for years. Right. So he is just crazed and not really focused. He seems to not recognize them. He seems to not hear them when they say, put your gun down. Um, the guards are able to disarm him and they later notice that his clothes, although it is raining and really cold outside, he feels super warm. Like he, his, his clothes, he's dry, he's hot. Well, you're coming in with all that heat from all over the place. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like I, I have an effect on people. Oh uh, yeah. So here I go saying something stupid, potentially. Potentially, though. Most likely. So Most the Italian likely. military police are apparently called carabiners? Listen, I don't know this. I'm thinking of, like, the clip Italian that Italian is not my first language, either. I'm but just going to call them the Italian military police so I don't yeah, sound stupid. Yeah, sound... I mean, how would you pronounce that? Where is Carabiner, it? Carabiners? <laughs> it like, looks like Pirates of the Carabiners? Well, it looks carabiners, but I don't know how the hell what that is. That doesn't look Italian, though. Well, we're going to call them the Italian military police, just oh, to save okay. face. I think that also clarifies that for 99% of the people. Yeah, unless you're from Italy, in which case you're mad that I'm definitely saying it wrong. In which case you've already left um, when we first said Genovia, so <laughs> sorry. Um, so the Italian military police, um, they investigated, which was uh, weird for them to do. Apparently it usually didn't warrant this, but he was so freaked out that they were like, okay, well, we're going to investigate anyway. Um, they ended up looking where they found Zenfreda and they found next to him 20 inch long and nine inch wide horseshoe shaped imprints behind the house. Ew. Um, they also at the same time were able to find 52 other people in town who said that they saw a bright glare coming from the neighborhood <gasps> at the same time that Zenfreda saw it, which oh is God. very validating. 52 witnesses Seriously. confirming that something was in the sky. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, so stories ended up getting published in the local newspaper and naturally there was a lot of skepticism. Um, but there were no explanations for Zanfredo's weird behavior. Um, the two big imprints in the grass that look like nothing we know of and the sighting by 52 other people that can confirm that Zanfredo saw something. Sure. Um, the main local opinion though was that Zanfredo must be crazy and the military police are wasting their time. 
Um, but Sanfreda is quoted saying, I don't know what it is that I saw, but I saw it and I'm not a liar. So he, okay, so I'm glad he's like, okay, though, for now. Oh, yeah. well, it happens he's, again, huh? It, yeah, I forgot. this is one of many, but currently he calms down and is relatively stable. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to keep it cool, but my microphone fell off again. We really need new equipment. Listen, we're overhauling this whole project one step at a time. We should probably just fucking fell swoop this shit. We really... That's true. We are doing a total overhaul of all of our equipment. I mean, we got a green screen. Clearly. We are trying out some new other stuff. We got a new camera, as you can tell. We broke all of our microphones. So we really decided, oh, hey, here's all the projects we want to do. Let's do all of them and then neglect that we just need basic audio equipment. So Yeah, that's kind of an Emma and Christine thing. We were like, what's the most dramatic thing we could do? That's the one. And ignore all the boring stuff. The, nece the necessities. The necessities. Yeah. So... So on the docket for next week is new audio equipment. Do you want duct tape? We got duct tape. And also said I could buy a ring light. I did. I thought maybe our faces will look like at least 5% greater for you. I'm so excited for that. Um, We're going to look so glamorous. We'll probably nail it to the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Are boy. you solid? I mean, I just won't touch it anymore. That is one of the main rules of this studio. Just don't touch just it don't and maybe it won't touch fall. anything. Um... So yeah, so the guards that have known him for years, and they witnessed him acting totally crazed, um, they have been, one of them specifically has been quoted saying, I can state with certainty that he is a clear thinking man with no strange fantasies in his head. Uh, when we went to investigate the scene the next day, he almost didn't want to come. He was so scared. Oh. Only something exceptional could have frightened him so badly. Wow, so he's really like not... So his homies are like, this guy is usually so level-headed. Right. So. Well, if Carla believed him right away, like... Yeah, I mean, if listen, everyone just follow Carlo's, like, moral compass. I don't know if I trust Carlo as much as I trust, um, the Z guy. Zanfredo. You know what? The day that you're getting attacked by an alien, though, you're gonna, like, really okay. wish you had Carlo on the phone. You're right. You're right. I know I am. I but know. I'll have you on the phone and you'll do the same goddamn thing. I'll be like, Car call me Carlo. Hey, Carlo oh. here. <laughs> uh, so, to help remember what the hell happened... Um, Zanfreda was hypnotized, so, mm. and this becomes a regular run theme, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was hypnotized by Dr. Moro Moretti, just so Hold people on. know his name. My chair, I forgot how much I can't hate these chairs, I can't move. Yeah, we're, we're so loud. Sorry. We're trying, we're trying out the, the old director's chairs that I made Christine for, like, our, like, tenth episode or something. <laughs> There's... They're so cool, but they're so loud and they make horrible sounds. We gotta get like, oh, on the docket, WD-40. I think they're just, they just need to be oiled. Sure. You oil them. Okay. I don't know how to do that. Okay. I'll bring oil next time. Um, all right. Anyway, you guys wanted to see what it's like behind the scenes? Did now you? you get to do that Did if you? you are watching us on YouTube right now. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh yeah, so Zanfreda says in his hypnosis, he was abducted by, quote, Monsters 10 feet tall with hairy green skin, uh, yellow triangular eyes, and red veins across the forehead. Ew, they are ugly. Uh, they apparently brought him to a hot, bright place where they examined him. Mm -mm. Uh, which, at this point, he gives no further description about that. But then he says, they come from a third galaxy, and that, quote, they want to talk with us, and they will soon return in larger numbers. No! Firm pass. Apparently, they also spoke, fun fact, with a luminous device over their mouths to translate oh. their words into Italian so you can understand them. That's fun. I want one of those. What I think is fun is that as this goes on, the way that they speak to him always varies. So this was a luminous device over their mouth. The next time it's something else. Next time it's something else. Really? So oh, you mean the next abduction? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So it seems like they've got a lot of different ways to be able to communicate outside of telepathy. Interesting. Um... So that was the first encounter and his recollection of it after hypnosis. But this is the second encounter. Okay. Only three nights later from his first abduction, Zanfreda is working again and he uh, is driving his car. He seems to be driving in his car a lot when these things happen. Mm -hmm. He loses total control of the car. Um, and he later reported that the car was driving itself uphill despite him braking as hard mm. as he could or trying to s swerve or steer the car, it was just driving itself. It's one of those malfunctioning Google cars that like drive over people. Yeah, it was just like its own Hot Wheels. Aww. 
So he radios it in, in the car. He's just sitting there in this, like, fast car. Uh, and he said, <laughs> you know, as Help. you do. And Going up a hill, that's right. so bizarre. Okay. And he also, uh, he could he, when he radio radioed it in, he was telling them what was going on. He also said that he couldn't see well because of the fog, which I find interesting. I didn't hear this anywhere else, but I personally noticed in these stories that the fog always seems to happen right before an abduction. Interesting. So. In just these or like in general? Just in the ones that, no, just in this case. In this story. Okay. Um, it sounds like the fog is almost a... I feel like the cliche move of the of a UFO kind of shining a, a beam of light at you and picking you up. It seems like fog in this case is their own beam of light. A little like precursor to... Like the second you're in the fog, that's when you get abducted. Oosh. Okay. Um, so he's reporting it in. He's also saying, I can't see well because of the fog, so I don't even know where this car is. It could, it could drive me into a tree. I don't know where I'm going. All of a sudden, while driving, the car is going very fast. The car just stops abruptly no. he even like hits his head on the steering oh, wheel God. it's like it just halts out of nowhere um and it probably drove itself for like a mile um he ends up radioing and again saying the car has stopped i saw a bright light now i'm getting out fair i yep, would too yes so he and he radioed it in um and then he was found at one in the morning in a field near that road again his clothes were really warm and dry despite the fact that when they found him he was outside and it was raining yeah, and it was all that foggy, misty. Yeah, and he's, mm -hmm. he's like he's like hot to the touch. Mm -mm. <clears throat> so, he was found crying, and he was saying, quote, They say I must leave with them. What about my children? I don't want to. Oh my god, this yeah. is disturbing. Yes, this is frightening. Is. I don't know about this. So, the Pirates of the Carabiners, uh, <laughs> also known as the military police. So Johnny Depp shows up. It's a whole thing. So then, like, every character Johnny Depp's ever played all come together at no, one time. thank you. I do not have time for that. Uh, so they end up getting... They hear about this report and look into it again. And they found that... So that they come to the site as it's happening. And they find that the car's roof was apparently hot enough to have been in the sun all day. That's how hot this car felt. Um, while, again, it was cold and rainy outside. It was December. Oh, and yeah. And it feels like this car has been out in the in the sun on the hottest day. Weird. Um, apparently, they also said that the interior of the car was, quote, hot as an oven. Okay. Um, and surrounding the car, they found more footprints that were equally creepy in size. Like those, like, hoof prints? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, 20 inches, that's, like, almost two feet tall. Yeah, I was hoping that um, those were going to be, like, the landing pads for the UFO. I didn't know if they were, like... I don't ever really get an explanation. They might be just, like, the imprint of the ship itself that landed. But, like, ugh, either way. If those are their feet, that's really creepy. That's worse. It's like Clifford as an alien. Like horse feet. So, uh, Zanfretta's gun, they realized, had also been fired five times, but even during hypnosis, uh, Zanfretta couldn't remember right away who he had shot at. Um, he just, the bullets were just gone. Um. Oh. So then he, uh, got hypnotized again. And he ended up remembering that this time he was stripped down and forced to wear a painful helmet. Oh, no. That apparently the helmet was another communication device where when he put the helmet on, he could understand their language. But it was painful to wear. <gasps> um, so it sounds like they were kind of altering his brain and he could feel it happening. Yuck. Okay, that hurts. I don't like that. He also remembers seeing one alien uh, take his... G All right. Welcome, after our technical difficulty, We're round bad. one of Hi. the camera shutting down. Um, so the last thing I said was he was stripped and forced down to, and, and have, having to wear a painful helmet so he could understand what they were saying. One alien actually took his gun from, after being hypnotized, he remembers the alien taking his gun and firing bullets into a panel um, that he assumes must have been a bulletproof panel or an indestructible panel. And he assumes they were doing it just to see what this weapon was, if it could, if it was a weapon, if it could hurt them. It was like almost I like a if test. If they used it and were like, oh my god, this is basically like a, a rock slingshot, like right. compared to our technology. I mean, that's how I, I would describe so, it. Right? Yeah. yeah. If, how do you describe a gun to someone who doesn't? Who's like, who guns? isn't from Earth? Uh, those we had those two million years ago. Oh, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Nice try. So, uh, so that explains where the bullets went. Um, oh, sure. He Oh, this is under hypnotism. Under hypnotism, okay, he okay. found out later what was going on. But he, when they found him originally, he was like, I don't know where the bullets went. I don't know who I shot. Interesting. Um, in hypnotize, while hypnotized, he also realized that 
uh, they were requiring him to leave his home and family behind and stay with them. And he apparently said, oh. they, when he, when I say he said this in response, it's assumed he said it in response because these are the things he's saying in the psychiatrist's in room in his session. So these are the things that he mumbled and we assume he said right. that he's remembering. Okay. So in the hypnotism session, he was recorded saying, quote, I know that you need me, but I don't want to. I like to be alone. I have two children. I feel good this way. And after all, you are not human beings. You are horrible. Hey, well, again, that is not going to get your way. He's a fighter, not he's, a lover, he, apparently. Ah, he's got to be like, listen, I love it here. I'd be like, your eyes are so beautiful. In uh, fact, and triangle. And triangular. <laughs> In fact, I might even buy like a condo up here if you Yeah, like give me, the, me, give like drop a pin GPS wise. I'll, I'll find just, you. I'll, You've, I'll rent a pod. Let me go get my shit. And then, and I'll come back. I thought you said my ship. I was like, yeah, I'll go get my ship. I'll get my ship. You get your ship. And we'll combine those Beam things. it together and... <laughs> in a big old cloud. And then he takes his kids out of Genovia and fucking runs for it. Wait a minute. The end. And the that's end. my story. Goodbye. No. Um, so they, he says he was required to eventually leave his home. But then he said some fighting words. So mm -hmm. I don't think they like that. Mm -mm. All this information ends up getting compiled into the report on the sighting of UFOs by Fortunato's and Freda in 1979. And this uh, report actually got sent through like magistrates offices and things just to see like if there was anything they could do or like wow, raise they awareness. Took it seriously, huh? Yeah. Wow. And uh, the military police even at one point defended him and said that the believability level of this report was good. Like they, wow. even they're unsure of what's going on. Okay. Um, also in 1978, the year that these happened, there were so many UFO sightings all over Italy that at one point the Minister of Defense actually had to speak to the Italian Congress about it and like give his opinion on what was going on. Oh my God. So he was not alone in having these UFO sightings. This just happened to, he had the most condensed experiences. Wow. Um, but he definitely wasn't alone in reporting sightings well, that year. Especially if he's getting hypnotized and getting so much detail out of it. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and he is known, uh, I don't know about in all of UFO, you know, ufology, I don't know where he stands when it comes to in the entire world, but at least in Italy, um, and maybe Europe, he is the person that gave the most documented, most documented accounts of his experience. So he has the most elaborate report that people take seriously because oh. he's the one that has given the most information. All right. Um, so Zinfreda's second encounter, which I already mentioned, uh, brought even more critical publicity. A lot of people still thought it was a sham and he was just trying to get attention. Um, so he was, like I said, hypnotized for the second time, but that hypnotism actually, he broadcasted live on TV Oh, because he wanted to prove to everyone that like it, he was legitimately discovering things for the first time and people should listen to what maybe the doctor has to say in the room so that they're not being so critical of him. Did he make money off it? No, he never made any, he never profited from okay. any of his experiences. That's good to know. I always wonder. Um, so I think he was also really scared and the fact that people were judging him or not believing him, he was like, fuck, like, I don't know what's going on either. I'm He's just like, gonna- They want to take my fam me away from my family, dude. Yeah. I don't, I don't like it. So uh, he broadcasted his hypnotism. Uh, the doctor ended up saying after his hypnotism, quote, the man is in a state of shock, but he's perfectly sane. So it actually ended up helping give him more credibility to the public, which was exactly why he did it. He wanted to be trusted. Um, but then he also started getting invited to like TV shows and like a famous personality back then, his name was Enzo Tortora. And he had a show named Portobello and he invited Zanfred on his show. Um, there were articles it about him. so made up. I know. Portobello and... <laughs> and uh, there were articles... Alfredo. Artic <laughs> and Tortellini. Pizzeria. Mamma Mia. Uh, Mamma Mia. That should be... Wait a minute. That should be a Broadway show. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, there were also articles uh, about him regularly in newspapers and magazines all over the world. And he was known as the man abducted by UFO. Okay. So he is getting kind of international notoriety at this point, but he was happy at the time of like, I'm glad that at least everyone saw what was happening and it's been confirmed by, pro by professionals. I'm not faking this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had a third encounter um, in 1979. So a few months have actually passed. Oh, of course, he's he, happening. he probably thought he was safe at this point. Oh. Um, this time he's again driving, this time on a motorcycle in an area called Quarto. Does that mean four? I don't know why I'm Wait, asking. Wait, spell it. Quarto. Oh, quarto. Yes. Cool. I 
think. Quarter, probably. Does it mean quarter? I think so. Well, I mean like for fourth. Yeah. I don't know what it means. I'm gonna guess. It doesn't matter. It's an area. The, the quarter. Sure. Okay. That's where he was on a motorcycle. Sure. He disappeared. Shocker at this point. <laughs> oh god. And the guards found him two years late. Two, two hours later. Sorry. I was like, <laughs> I can't even with this guy anymore. Like, I give up. <laughs> Uh, He's a lost cause in my book. Yeah, after year one, it's, I, I give They're up. They're still looking bad. Uh, he disappeared and guards found him two hours later on top of a mountain. Uh -huh. um, Mount Fasque. Fasque. How the hell? What the hell? I'm sure it wasn't like a like a crazy mountain. I think it was just like a really tall hill. But it's called Mount Fasque. Um, there apparently is only one road to get there. And it was patrolled heavily by security guards that night, and they no one saw anybody go there. So how did he end up there? Is the question. Um, how did they find him? Oh, there's just already security up there. Yeah, like I, I don't. Whatever happened where he was wow. in the quarter. Yeah. And then he just showed up on a hill. For him to have gotten there, it was right. nobody reports seeing anybody. Weird. Okay. And there was only one way to get there. Weird. So they don't know what happened. They were like, all right, we'll get back in the hypnotism room because you got to explain <laughs> Doctor, it again. What's his name? Doctor? Dr. Moretti. Dr. Moretti's waiting for you. And so uh, this time he is not just taken to like the same psychiatrist. He's taken to the International Center of Medical and Psychological Hypnosis in Milan. Ooh. And he's injected consensually with truth serum because he's like, I don't. Oh, dear God. Like whatever comes out of my mouth, I want people to Ew. trust me. Um, he confirmed everything that he had said before in previous hypnotism, uh, sessions. And, uh, he also said that in this situation, he was, quote, lifted from the ground into the alien spaceship by a mysterious green light. Okay. No fog? No fog uh, that I can see in this one. They're really, like, changing the game up every time. They really keep him on his toes. I wonder why this is. Every time he's driving, though, they're like, ooh, that guy, he's, he yeah, wants true. to, apparently. He's switch vehicles. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Even on a moped. Uh, yeah, he's just burden away. <laughs> just on a lime. Uh, a doctor uh, at the facility, get that, I think the one that actually administered the true serum, he was also quoted saying, no human being can knowingly lie while under the pentothal treatment. Mm. So I think it's very probable, in his opinion, that Sanfreda had these encounters. So even like hypnotism, hypnotists, doctors are like, we have done everything we can to make sure he's telling the truth. And it's, this is all coming out so confirmed by I him. I feel like you probably already said this, but just backtracking. So was he hypnotized after being injected? Or was that just? I don't know what I don't know what order it was. I'm pretty sure you can bullshit through truth serum like like it's not like foolproof. But I don't know. maybe if you're hypnotized on truth serum, it probably is a lot harder to bullshit. I don't know right? what order it was. I would think so. Yeah. Like I feel like it would at least lower your ability to to, to I don't know. Like you make you less mm -hmm. manipulative. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Make That's you more a amenable question. to like the effects of the truth serum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know. I mean, I'm clearly. But what am I? Just like, a professor of science. What am I? Just a PhD candidate? Listen. False. I am not. Remember that time I was a PhD candidate and then I was like, mm, I'm going to drop out and meet Christine Schieffer and start a podcast. Oh, come on. Listen. Good choices were made Listen, that day. I tell choices. you what. All right. So let's talk about the fourth encounter. So this was also in 1979. This was in December against so this was the last one was in July. This one's in December. So they're starting to spread out a little more. And this one was at 1030 at night and Zemfreda disappears while driving. Uh -huh. While looking for him, because at this point they're like, this guy's gone for five minutes. He must have gotten abducted. So guards are just on top of it. Like, oh, he's missing. Let's like go look looking under all the tables. And he, like... they, he, they must have given him a radio to bring home. <laughs> so while looking for him, four guards actually do see something that looks like a UFO in the sky. Oh, no and two bright lights come down directly on them while they're driving around and all of their car engines die. Oh! So all at the same time, multiple mm -hmm. cars die, two lights come down directly on them when they see what they think is a UFO. One guard actually shot at the UFO and oh, the great. lights turned off and the thing in the sky flew away. Okay, well it worked. I didn't think that would work. I didn't think it would work either, but I guess they like had their hand on a gun at one point and figured out what bullets are and they're like, oh, let's not mess around with that. So they got out of there. Oh man. Okay. Apparently this is sad, but a lot of, they, it's, I'm just going to say it anyway. Um, two of those guards that 
were also part of that experience. One was so shocked that he could never fully recover about the experience. Oh my God. Another one couldn't recover to the point where he ended up committing suicide later <gasps> because he was so rattled by the Woof. situation. Or so the story goes, I don't know what else was going on oh, in his personal no. life. Oh my God. Um, but so that makes this the, one of the only alien abduction cases where there was a victim after the fact. Cause and they- it wasn't even the person who was abducted. No, just someone who apparently experienced That's a UFO. Really? And they, Tragic. they have, I don't know if this is, I don't know if they should have or not, but in all the stories, they have put that suicide into the framework of the story. So they have made it seem like he was a victim, a, a murder victim or a, a, a death victim. Like it wasn't by his own. Right. Mm -hmm. They've, they've played it up so that the UFO situation could have been one of the reasons he couldn't. Questionable. Yeah. But sure. I, that's, I'm, I'm apprehensive to. All right definitively say, oh, because he saw Let's a UFO. Just say, we're not making that claim by any means. No. He happened to commit this suicide right after something really, really wild happened. May or may not have played into that. Yeah. Um, that being said, Zenfredi gets hypnotized again because he just knows his place at this point when he gets abducted. He goes missing, they find him, and he's like, I'm going to go get hypnotized. Mm. So what he says is an hour before he was found, he was at a gas station um, he heard someone calling his name from the shadows. Very ghosty, but... Uh, no. Apparently he couldn't resist it. It was like a siren oh, lulling no. him. no. So, he walked towards the voice, and he heard the voice order him to drive into a small cloud floating above the ground. Which could also be fog. Sure, okay. Um, but apparently there was a small dark cloud. He said drive into it. So he did, he drove into the cloud, and his car levitated inside the cloud, and the next thing he knew, he was on a spaceship with a humanoid figure. Oh, it sounds like the Jetsons. <laughs> it sounds very cartoonish now. It does. Like Drive a, into a cloud. It sounds like a Harry Potter 2 when his car's yeah. flying away. Harry Potter 2. The Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> Before people yell at me. Harry Potter Jr. <laughs> Oh. But but make it sci-fi. <clears throat> but make it siffy. Mamma mia. Make it Magical siffy. <laughs> so, uh, the humanoid was apparently tall with a bald egg-shaped head. Oh my. Um, he was dressed in a checkered suit with a shirt underneath that was made of steel. Whoa! So like a steel tank top and like a checkered That's blazer. That's kind of fun. That's funky. I feel like that could be New York Fashion Week. If I went to a club wearing that, I'm not saying I wouldn't get attention. In the right ways. Mm. So, uh, sure, Zanfretta actually saw... Maybe like a Sam's Club. I would yeah. get attention regardless if I'm wearing a, a steel shirt. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, so Zanfretta saw on this spaceship, while walking around with the checkered humanoid, mm. he saw transparent cylinders filled with strange blue liquid. Oh. Ooh, ah, ah. Um, thank you. Um, I listen, I'm practicing. So one of the cylinders that had strange blue liquid also had a frog-shaped body in it that the aliens called, quote, an enemy of ours from another planet. What? So apparently there's frogs on another planet that are much more evil than evil the frogs, frogs we have. Or they're good frogs and they're enemies of these guys because they're the good guys. Oh, good maybe we actually saw and these are the bad a guys. friend. A frog friend. No nope. friend. We'll, we'll figure a, it out. A, a, Pal pole. A tad pal. Never mind. We'll work on it. <laughs> we'll shop it. We'll shop, we'll it. shop it. A totally great friend. Oh, sh okay, sure. Uh, so, which also is interesting to me that the theory is that there's animals just like ours, but with totally different personas on another planet. <laughs> Who have, like, vendettas? Right. <laughs> it's kind of like Guardians of the Galaxy and, like, Rocket the yes, Raccoon. Exactly. But he's like, I'm not a raccoon. It's like, okay, but you are. But maybe, like, there, maybe that frog was saying he wasn't a frog. It's not a frog. No, he's just totally he's a great a friend. Tad pal. <laughs> tad pal. So, oh my god. That are you still with us? No. Did you leave? I thought you were talking to me. I was like, no, I've left. <laughs> I've left the building. Checked out. Me. So, uh, in two more of those blue liquid cylinders were a preserved big bird. So apparently there's also birds. And a caveman-like human body. Oh my god. So... That makes me wonder if there's cavemen in another world, or have they time traveled and like gotten a prehistoric human, are now here, and now they're gonna go get a future person, or they've just been around for that long that they were around when we were cavemen. The possibilities are endless, I tell you. So during hypnosis uh, of telling this story, 
uh, Zanfretta apparently says out loud in his in the session, where have you been? And what do you want to do in Spain? Why? But all together, that will scare people. As if he's talking to the aliens telling him some elaborate plan in Spain. Oh my god. The next day, coincidentally, the international service of the Italian press found out that there were there was news of a guy in Spain who was driving in Guadalajara and he saw a UFO which followed his car for about an hour. It blinded the driver and he lost control of his car and it went off the road. And that happened to just be press that got spread internationally did the he, next day. Did he die? Oh, I don't know anything else. It just was con convenient that someone in Spain happened to see a UFO the oh, next day. Um, that but, was their big plan. Someone sees a UFO. Like, spook them. Yeah, I don't know what uh -huh. the I don't know what was supposed to happen. And um, to me, that's kind of fishy. Apparently, the dates complicate things because Sanfredo was abducted on Sunday. He was hypnotized on Monday, but. The, the guy in Spain saw this thing on Saturday. Oh. So it's like, okay, so whatever ha whatever's happening tomorrow already happened. Oh. It doesn't really make sense. It just was a convenient thing that people started throwing into the storyline of like, oh, and sure. then in Spain something did happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm here to give you all the facts, so that's okay, what's going yeah, on yeah, now. yeah, 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 yeah. But other than that, we have no idea what plan they had in Spain yeah, that would scare it. everyone. I don't love it. Maybe Zanfretta talked them out of it. Maybe. So the aliens then give Zanfretta an object, uh, a gift of sorts. It is a transparent sphere with a pyramid inside of it. Oh. And from each corner of the pyramid, pointing into the middle, it's sparking. That sounds pretty. So a glass circle with a pyramid with sparks going into the center. Wow, I kind of like that. I want one. Apparently it's also called a, quote, golden tetrahedron that will uh, rotate in suspension. Wow. It's a fancier version that I read. I want one. Well, the aliens say, quote, this is, with this it's possible to understand who we are and how we live. It sounds like a pretty fancy gift. Cool. Apparently, Zanfretta did not want to take the object, and the aliens told <laughs> he's him- so ungrateful, this guy. He's, look, he's That's made it out alive in like four different experiences already. So he didn't want to take the object. The aliens told him, oh, it's not for you. Give this, <laughs> give this oh, sphere. This. It's, it's like, actually not for you. You're actually the middleman. Nice try. Give this sphere to Dr. J.A.H. Or Dr. J.A. Hynek. And, uh- Wait, I know that guy. Yeah. Well, Zanfretta apparently didn't know originally, but- Presumably, the gift was in the future to be given to Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who is a famous scientist and UFO researcher. Yeah. So if that story is true, wow. then the aliens even know who their, who our legendary UFO researchers are. They're like, Zanfredo, you haven't like given us one fucking inch, so forget <laughs> you. Can you just bring this home? Can you pass this on to someone else? You're just going to be like... We know this guy cares, so let, gonna, let him are. know this is how we live. And Our he can messenger find out. from now on. Well, instead of giving the sphere to Hynek, he hid the object somewhere in the hills near Genoa. What? Okay. Um, which I'll get to later. Um, the next encounter, I've only got one more after this, but the next encounter was in 1980, only two months later. Um, Zanfretta disappeared again, but the radio, the car radio actually stayed in contact and had a signal Ooh. for the entire time. Um, so they were able to find him really quickly. He was found freezing and in shock and witnesses even told the police later, minutes before rescuers arrived, they had all seen a huge light in the sky shaped like a blimp. <gasps> and during hypnosis, this is when Zanfretta started to speak a new unknown language. Oh my God. Okay, I'm ready for this. And I don't know how to pronounce any of this. I'm gonna confirm with Christine's eyes that I shouldn't even try all of this. I mean, it's like a made up language. It literally is like someone just like threw their head on the keyboard and it just spelled it out its own like stuff. It looks like Juniper just walked all over my computer and deleted a bunch of files. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is why this video is messed stared up. at you the whole time Let's while I did it. Let's just say that that's why. So. It's not my fault, Junies. Just per, just literally just slam your hand on the keyboard and that's what this looks like. Yeah, so I'm not gonna. It's truly just a bunch of letters. But Zanfretta did say that what was happening is he was contacting the aliens and then his voice changed. No. And he said to, I guess, in, to the session that he was in, you can't work out anything in a case like this. To believe or not to believe doesn't mean anything. Each thing in its own time. It's pretty cryptic to mm. me. He was abducted again six months later. Oh my. 
Um, but at this point, he is under 24-hour close observation. <laughs> Please there, stop. So apparently he was acting really weird. He was, uh, he was like about to be abducted, but they found him before the aliens could get to him. Like he had already kind of escaped somehow and they grabbed him. Okay. But under hypnosis, because he's just their best client at this point, <laughs> Zanfretta was apparently absolutely out of control. At this point, he refused to answer any questions. He was not cooperative. He was saying things that made no sense in English. Like he was saying, apparently he kept repeating the phrase, question with negative answer, Tixel. Oh, that just gave me chills. That is creepy, dude. So it's almost like they were, maybe they, I don't know what Tixel means. Well, they have that helmet. Maybe they fucked up his brain a little bit. Maybe, or maybe they were talking through him and trying to tell him how to respond, like question with negative oh, answer. Oh, oh, like he was now the messenger. Yeah. The vessel. So. At that point, the doctor was quoted saying, what is happening here is scientifically inexplicable to I me. I was also quoted, but only the first half. What, <laughs> what is happening, happening here? That's all. Um, scientifically inexplicable. Yeah. Yikes. So they didn't know what was going on, but Ugh. other than those experiences, there were not many more experiences that we know of. Um, Zanfretta recalls only a few things from this time in his life, but he says that he's had encounters uh, up to 11 times of both the third and fourth kinds. Ooh. Um, I'm going to quickly describe what the difference between those are, but I actually feel like that might be a story later, me talking about the different types of abductions. Um, I don't know yet, but I'm going to look into it and I don't want to ruin anything for my potential future. So the difference between the th a third kind abduction and fourth kind is the third kind is if any animated creature is present. So you don't have to necessarily interact with them, but you can just see them. Okay. Um, that could be humanoids, apparently uh, even robots, because it's an animated creature. Sure. Or human occupants on a UFO. So you don't even have to see an alien. You just have to interact or watch from a distance something else living or moving. What about like a cryptid? No. I guess so. This, and specifically, so there's a, a actual scale for alien abduction specifically. Right. So this is... This is alien though. Alien, yeah. Okay. Um, and apparently there are six subtypes to that. So, oh, sure, of course there are. Which I, I'll get into another time. The fourth kind, which is also a movie about aliens, mm. that's apparently not even on the scale. Um, apparently the scale goes all the way up to the third kind. So he just like invented a new one. And then the fourth kind, yeah. The fourth kind is like a full-blown abduction um, instead of experiencing something from a distance. What do you mean? Like being taken onto a UFO and Wait, being so probed then, and examined. Isn't that what's the third one? The third one is like from a distance, like seeing, like you can oh, see an alien. It. It's not like an abduction. Yeah. Like God. knowing something okay. is nearby or like, oh, I saw a UFO or I saw a person on a UFO or telepathically. Or I saw an alien or something. Yeah. Okay. But not interacting and being probed or examined or Got taken on a ship. Got it. Okay. Not being probed. Good. Well, Thanks. everyone likes that. No. So Zanfretta says that somewhere in the hills, because I told you he hid that uh -huh. tetrahedron pyramid thing. Um, he says that somewhere in the hills is where he hid the sphere um, that was given to him by the aliens, and he doesn't know why, but for some reason he's drawn to go there and visit it at least twice a month, Ooh. and he doesn't know why, but whenever he's near it, he's waiting for something. Ugh. Oh, God. Oh, no, 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 no. He also later described these creatures as hairy, green, loose skin, um, mm -hmm. with points on the sides of their face and rounded fingertips, possibly amphibian. Ah, so, like that frog tap. Tad pal. Maybe that's why they are foes. Enemies of the state. Too similar. Mm. So based on this description, um, they could be a few things, which I know none, nothing about any of these, but the <laughs> list that I have found um, over my research was, it could be reptoids, I never heard of. Okay. Veronis, Ver Veronis aliens, which apparently sure. have been seen uh, in the former Soviet Union in 1989. Ooh. Uh, they could be Loveland Frogmen. Which oh yeah, that's Ohio. I'm excited to learn about that one. That's the next, that's like 20 minutes from my house. Interesting. You didn't know about this? No. I've told you to cover this before. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I, well, I already took a picture of it to remember. Oh, good. They could also be uh, Tetonians because during one of the hypnosis sessions, uh, Zanfretta had said that they came from a dying planet in the third galaxy called Tetonia. Ooh. And they were solely looking at Earth to move there oh, no, no, when no, all no. of a sudden Tetonia was no longer uh, livable. Um, the aliens are apparently, this was from only one source that I saw, but 
apparently Zanfretta also said that these aliens were called Dargos and they would be completely peaceful if they were to come here. However, we all know how tender and emotional and sympathetic Zanfretta has ever seemed. He told them when they said, oh, we would come peacefully. Mm -hmm. During a hypnosis session, he was recorded saying to them, I know you were trying to come more frequently. No, you can't come to Earth. People will get scared if they even look at you. You can't make friendship. Please go. <laughs> God, and that sounds so familiar. It's like you just said that to me. You can't make friendship. You can't make friendship. Please go. Sorry. Um, um, one thing I was going to say is, uh, it's to be fair, he's not wrong. Like, if they showed up, that's the true. US military is not going to welcome them with any military. He's not going to welcome them with open arms. I think Either maybe the, it's the masses are not going to love. Tough love. I think he's, he's like, I'm just telling you now, yeah. we won't be cool with it. You can't make friendship. We as a, as a, as a generic mass of people won't really like, agree. Maybe you can make friendship, but we can't. Like, I'm down, but, um, well, but they're not down. Yeah, there's a lot of us and we have some issues um, with triangle eyes. Right. I don't think it's going to work out. So Zanfred is, uh, is well Zanfretta's case is most famous um as the sorry welcome back so the uh Italian Center for UFO Studies has actually stated that the case was entirely false purely off of the drawings that Zanfretta has done uh when he was hypnotized versus when he was awake apparently the drawings are entirely different um but if you talk to anyone in the like hypnosis community, they'll say, well, of course, drawings of an experience when you're hypnotized are going to be different than when you're awake and can't remember the experience. Like one's going to be really clear and right. But doesn't hypnosis like enhance your memory? It's not like I don't know enough about hyp hypnosis to say that. Uh, my understanding of it was always that you remember it until you come to and you forget. But at least someone else has written down all the information, so like mm -hmm. it's still repressed. But at least okay. you can now talk through it so that it will come to you in a waking state at some point when you're ready for it. But the, these are not confirmed by... <laughs> I'm totally us. guessing. I'm totally... <laughs> that was my understanding of what it was. I feel like I had a different understanding, but I also don't know. My therapist does a lot of hypnotherapy, so maybe I'll ask her. You you have the connection. Maybe I'll do some drawings and tell you what happens. I've literally never met a hypnotist ever. If I did, I would demand they hypnotize yeah. me. Well, there's also the issue of like recovered mem like false memories and stuff, which... So, oh. many think hypnosis is uh, generally unreliable um, because doctors could feed the patient false mm -hmm. memories. Um, and most journalists are also critical of Zimfred's experiences, except for a reporter named Rino De Stefano. Rino De Stefano? De uh, Stefano? I don't know. I would say De Stefano, but I don't know. I would say De Stefano. Reno. De Stefano. De Stefano. That sounds Italian. Sure. I don't know. Reno, are you there? Uh, so Reno wrote a book uh, called The Zenfreda Case, which was published in 1984, and as of only a couple years ago, it's now also uh, in English. Um, and also, an Italian broadcasting network has made a a docudrama about Zanfretta in his case. Ooh, that's so fun. So he's still kind of getting some notoriety, but he's basically known as like the big alien abduction story in Italy. Wow. Um, before I end, I do want to say that there is a link that we can put in the description for you guys. Um, but on YouTube, there are clips of his actual hypno hypnosis sessions. Cool. So um, we'll, wow, we'll, we'll put the neat. link in. I watched it. It's pretty cool. I mean, you can, you're can you watching him lying that's down and really going through this. So if you want to watch it, we will provide that for you. Yeah, I'll add that to the thing. Um, I also wanted to specify that my therapist does not do like regression therapy. She does or hypnotherapy. She does like phobia hypnotherapy. To be clear, like I'm not saying she does like uh, you know fringe stuff. I'm saying she does like for phobias. Both of my parents have been hypnotized. Um, my mom got hypnotized to stop drinking Diet Coke. <laughs> okay. Um, and to start drinking more water, and it really it's supposed to be extremely effective it messed with her too uh oh no i mean like she's fine but she uh she now has an issue where like i guess whatever the hypnotist said it she registered it in her head as like you need water on you at all times or you'll die and so uh that's just how her brain read it i'm sure that's not how i'm sure that's not how it was actually taken or handled or said but her brain put it in that way, and so now if she's if she doesn't have a bottle of water next to her at all times, she has a full blown panic attack. Oh my god! But she hates Diet Coke, so 
well, you know, she switched out end. one problem for another. But yeah, I hear it's really effective for like um, handling trauma and phobia and that kind of thing. But who's to say? I haven't done it yet. I've been planning, we've been planning on it for my needle phobia, but we'll see. Oh, I'm too scared. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I'll let you know if I ever end up doing that because I'm going to encourage you on that because I want to ask questions. Well, that's like an IV every eight weeks. It's about time I fucking get, Fair. Over, get over it, but we'll see. Anyway, that is the story of oh, uh, Zephyr. Wow, Zephyr, that's pretty crazy. Um, I, think so. I also want to also add that I'm pretty sure it's Genoa. I feel like just to, like so people don't, it's Genoa. Okay, no one make fun of Christine, only make fun of me. Well, no, I'm just saying because we were, oh boy, because we were unsure. So I think it's general. Gotcha. Anyway, okay, my turn? Yep. Cool. You're fine, you're gonna be okay. Okay. All right, let's do this. Let me lock it and take off my skull bracelet. Oh God. Okay, are you holding up? Yeah, you talk to the youths for a minute. Christine's wrists are fat. <laughs> it's stuck. <laughs> Good. Actually, your wrists are very dainty. You just have a wide set of fingers. My giant. Look. Okay. Here, I got you this. Thank you. I'm not going to put it on. Uh, I don't want you to. Okay. Skulls. You know, someone. Hey, that's from Thread Up. My Alexander McQueen bracelet. I told you. Look at that. Isn't it cool? Uh, one time someone mispronounced my last name as Skulls, and I thought it was pretty dope. Skulls? With a hard C, and we just ignore the H. Also, why on earth did you send me a picture that says, Stop showing me your butt? <laughs> you kept showing me your butt. It's literally a picture of my butt. <laughs> yeah. Chris, oh, listen, when we were trying to set up this green screen, I saw a lot of <sighs> angles of Christine I didn't know I'd ever need to see. Listen, it went both ways, so... I was bending in ways I didn't know I knew how to bend anymore. And was in some nooks and crannies. I also threw out my back a little bit. Just a little bit. And every, everything for the youths, realistically. We do it all for you. Youths. Youths. Okay, so um, this is one of the fucking craziest stories I've ever covered. It is bonkers, and I'm just going to warn you now. I'm very excited. Let's go. Right. Okay, this is the story of serial killer Peter Morin. Okay, before you do that, can you give me my Starbucks? Yes, it's gonna creak. Eva, please cut this out of the audio because they're gonna just kill me. We're gonna have to cut a lot of this stuff from the audio version. Well, this Pro is what the people on YouTube wanted to see. The audio is just gonna have like five minutes of content left. That's fine. By the time we're done with this. That's fine. So I won't oh. forget it. No, I didn't know what that noise was. Oh. Okay. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready to do some sipping. Okay, let's go. Sipping on that tea. Spit tea. What's the tea, Christine? Oh, yes. Um, I'll spill it. <laughs> <laughs> is your 14-year-old sister so proud of you? Work? No, she's just, her, her brain is exploding somewhere in embarrassment. Mm. Okay. So, I initially heard about this case because I was watching investigation discovery in my bed alone at night as i do so, sounds right um and there was an episode um of called of a show called obsession oh <gasps> yeah i wrote it about you yeah i'm sure you did you big creep mm -hmm. you did just send me a picture of my own butt so that's one of many in my phone christine yeah, i imagine so. hashtag obsession hashtag obsession hashtag obs ash ash no, no. okay mm -mm. That's fine. we'll work on it um, okay, so the episode is called Paging Sarah. Anyway, the show Obsession is very good, but it's like very, very, very scary. And it's basically about people who've had stalkers, essentially. Got and it. sometimes very upsetting, violent stalkers. Got it. Um, so, tread lightly, is what I'm saying. I hear you. This is the story of Sarah P Pizan. They didn't say her last name. P-I-S-A-N. Okay. Um, and so she actually told this story on Obsession about her from her perspective, but she's like a survivor obviously of this. So like she tells it from her perspective because I think it's like the most compelling and like detailed look of anything I could find online. But then as I go, I'll like add details that I've learned from what was going on from other articles and stuff. Got it. So January, 1980, uh, Sarah is 19 years old and she moves to Las Vegas, Nevada with her three young daughters after separating from her husband. Uh, they're like really excited for this new start in life. They move into a beautiful house with some friends and uh, Two days in Sarah starts looking for a job in the newspaper She finds an opening at a local gas station, which apparently is called 
Terrible Herbst is literally the name of this like gas station. Okay. Shame. Terrible name, but sure. I know. I'm like, let's talk about a, a really poorly foreshadowing, like a very right. poorly done foreshadowing. Like you should have a gas station that exists called like, you can get murdered here. And then <laughs> yeah, like exactly. be surprised when someone gets murdered. <laughs> exactly. Um, so she works at this place and, or she gets a, she interviews at the place, gets the job right away, is thrilled. She's like, everything's working out great. Um, now that's foreshadowing. Everything's working out fine. Um, the first night on the job, she meets a woman named Sherry who is taking the night off to go on a date with her new boyfriend. And, uh, so Sarah is filling in for her. Got it. Uh, Sh uh, Sherry is like this upbeat, fun, young woman, and she and Sarah become close friends really quickly. They're very similar. Um, and Sherry tells Sarah that her new boyfriend's name is Andrew Ireland, and he's somewhat of a loner, but, like, super sexy, and she's falling in love with him. That's what you say about me. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Christine. Especially after all that weird thing about you coming in from the sky covered in heat or whatever. Listen, that was the beginning of it all. That was where I knew. You were, you were scared, but you were curious. What a loner. Mm-hmm. Um, so she says, I noticed the next time Andrew came to pick up Sherry, he stood outside and stared at me through the window the whole time. No. She's like, I got a bad, bad vibe. Did you? Obviously. Mm -hmm. So she said he made her feel like a piece of meat the way she was staring, he was staring at her. And she's like, it was just the most unsettling, like he's there to pick up Sherry, but like just through the gas station window, she sees this guy like watching her. And it's just very, obviously very upsetting. Then a couple days later, Sherry comes to work totally upset. She's crying. She's like, she doesn't want to talk to anybody. They're like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Finally, she spins around and screams, he's married, okay? And turns out Andrew Ireland, her boyfriend, is actually married. And so she's devastated. You know, she thought this was going to go places. Um, and then the next day, uh, Sherry just didn't show up for work. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think we can probably all guess where this is going, but obviously at the time they were like, okay, this isn't normal for her. Um, she has never missed a day of work, or if she has, you know, she would call in. Uh, so this is a little bit strange and unsettling, but like, Sarah doesn't know her all that well. They've just become friends. So she just goes about her day, fills in for uh, Sherry whenever she can. Uh, next thing you know, police arrive and ask if Sarah and her co-workers know anything about Sherry's private life or if there's anyone who might want to hurt her. And at this point, they're like, okay, well, something's definitely wrong. Right, yeah. Um, obviously, uh, Sarah's like, okay, I know about this guy she was dating named Andrew Ireland, and the last time we saw her, she was, like, devastated that he had told her he was married, so maybe he has something to do with it, but she, all she knows is his name's Andrew Ireland. Got and, it. and he has dark hair and glasses. That's like all she knew um, from seeing, seeing him out the window. Right. So obviously that doesn't give police much information to go on. And the next day, police find Sherry's Jeep abandoned in a parking lot of the shopping center with her purse inside of it. That's awful. Yes. Meanwhile, Sarah is promoted to manager because Sherry's just hasn't showed up for work in so long. So Sarah ends up just replacing her as manager. And with Sarah's new job comes a pager that her supervisor would contact her on. It would beep and then the message would come through live, like as it was being spoken. So it wouldn't like record it or anything. Oh, okay. It would like, it would like beep beep and then the message would come through. Okay. So she was to have it on her if the supervisor needed to contact her or have her run into the station to, I don't know, fix something. I don't know. But she had it on her and she was supposed to have it on her at all times. So one morning, um, Sarah notices a car pull, pull into the gas station parking lot. The person parts, walks up to her, and he introduces himself as Robert. He's super sexy, very friendly. Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly Listen, you already called a description. You don't get to add more to your... No, no, no. I just forgot a couple words. <laughs> <laughs> that I called you. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's mm -hmm. the one. Um... So he's like the super attractive, very friendly and charming guy. He's like, you must be Sarah, you're the new manager. And she's like, huh, um, that's a little weird, but also like he must be just a local, it's a really small town, like he must just be a regular and she just hadn't met him yet. Okay. So she's like a little taken aback, but just assumed, you know, he had just heard her name around. So he- Is that Gio? It's Junie. Oh. oh. 
Hi, kitty kitty. We get another visitor. We'll see if he shows up. This is the kind of stuff we need to delete off of audio. Come here, Junie. Oh. Junie's like, I don't know what's happening. Come here. With this. Come here, little stinky kitty. Come here. Junie's been very wary uh, because of the new dog in the family. Yeah, he doesn't love that. What, petting him? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's a first. Well, he's he's just j skittish right now. Thanks, you're going to pick him up. Come here. I think he's just... Well, he's, he's just chilling now. He's exploring the green screen situation. I see. Yeah, I feel like every time somebody enters this room, it's completely different than it was. If you're on Patreon, we took a little video of what it looked like while we were setting this up, and it was a freaking disaster. It still is. It's just you can't see it. It's on the other side of the camera. Exactly. <laughs> it just looks awful. Come here, June. Um, okay. Da da da. Okay. We can put the audio back in, though. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so... Right, he assumes, or she assumes he's just a regular she hadn't met yet. Um, he asks her out almost immediately, and although she's flattered because this guy's like super sexy, uh, she tells him she has a lot going on, she has three kids, she has a gas station to manage, and she's new to town. Um, and so he's like, okay, you know what, I'll give you time to settle in, and we'll talk about it again another time. Which, like, she's a no guy, but... Alright. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna stop. Um, so he says, as he turns around, right, he says, I can wait, though. Well, don't. Don't forget me, okay? Ew. And then walks away. She's like, hmm. And she starts looking forward to his visits, because, like, he's just very charming and flattering and, like, really good looking and... None of it felt safe to me, though. Well, obviously not in this Foreshadowing. context. <laughs> Um, not even foreshadowing. We're literally talking about it in the context of a murder show on a TV show called Obsession. Fair. But, sure. Very romantic. Um, so one day, about four months after Sherry's disappearance, Sarah is taking a shower at her apartment when she hears her pager go off. So she grabs a towel, jumps out to listen to the message because it comes in live and she needs to hear it, and a voice, a man's voice, comes over the pager and says, You look good in a towel. That's disgusting. Absolutely not. Obviously, she uh, she closes the blinds. She makes the kids blah, blah, blah. She makes sure the kids are safe. But she's like, oh my god, maybe this is just some like one time peeping tom thing. I don't Ugh. like. I don't know. She just kind of tries to put it in the back of her mind, um, especially because there's literally no way to find out where the message came from. Um, so obviously, things don't stop there, as we know from how these stories always go. Um, in fact, it goes on for months that she gets these messages, and they start escalating. Of course. In a lot of the calls, he would start telling her the things he would do to her while she could hear him masturbating. Firm pass. He would say things like, first I'm going to tie you up, then I'm nope. going to cut you up. No. Oh. No. Yeah. 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 Um, of course, she has three young girls at home, so every time she hears this beeping, she has to like run and turn like turn the volume down to make sure it's not, because either it's right. her supervisor or this creep calling. Um, but on the other hand, she's like, just got this job, she just got promoted, and she's like, I don't even know what I would have said to my supervisor, um, and I don't think I would have been taken seriously, so she just is like, I'm gonna try and, um, just monitor it and make sure my kids don't hear. Yeesh. But at a certain point, she starts getting calls every couple hours, and then she starts to hear screams. Mm. While the caller was leaving messages, a woman could be heard screaming in the background. Oh no! Yeah, it's really disturbing, guys. Um, by the way, I was gonna say this in the beginning, but like, this is one of those stories where like, you're gonna wanna, like, at the end, you're probably gonna go check your locks and double check your locks and your windows and screen doors because oh my god! after I watched this episode, I was like, mm, I'm locking up the whole house and that's terrifying. Never letting Blaze inside again. Right. So, uh, meanwhile, obviously she's wondering, like, who the hell could possibly be doing this to me? Like, I'm new in town. And then she realizes that her pager number is displayed behind the gas station counter in a way where it could be seen from the outside. So literally anyone, anyone walking down the street could have seen it, which obviously doesn't narrow it down whatsoever in this town. Just makes it so much worse. Yeah. So there's, like, no narrowing it down. Um, and meanwhile, this handsome guy, Robert, keeps coming to the station almost every morning, continually asking her out. Which, by the way, guys or 
people in general is not a sexy way to flatter someone. If someone says no, no means no. No means no. No is a full sentence, as my stepmother would always say. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they don't have to give you a reason either. If they're not interested, walk the fuck away and move on. And guess what? If they do change their mind, maybe they'll let you know. But perseverance is not always what what you think it is. No. It's it not becomes as, stalking very quickly. It's not as charming as you maybe think it is. Um, yeah. So, right. So finally, she literally just agrees. She's like, you know what? Yeah, fine. This guy's handsome. Whatever. He's being pushy. I'm just going to agree to this date. No. Um, so she tells him to give her a call sometime and maybe they can grab a pizza or a beer. And he's like thrilled. He's like, great. Okay. I'll do that. 15 minutes later, Sarah's coworker says, hey, you have a phone call. It's Robert. He says, hey, it's some time. Oh my God. This guy. Yikes. I would have immediately regretted that. She's like, and so he, she's like, yeah, I guess so. And he's like, let's go out tomorrow. And she's like, okay, great. Pick me up uh, at my house. Gives him the address and says, okay. And before they hang up, so he's ready. She's ready to hang up. Okay. I was like, why are you kissing? No, he was stretching. And then he licked his lips. They're not going to even believe us. How do we show them? I don't know. I can't, I, listen, I don't know. We're stuck. Just know that there's a juniper wandering through our legs and I'm sorry you can't see him. Just wandering, just the, the light touch of a tail. Oh, oh, that just happened. He's not going to let me grab him. <gasps> Hi, what's up? What's Where's going on? He? He's right underneath you. He's just sitting with his handsome little brooding kitten chest. Hi, Baloo. Come here. <gasps> this is so nice. There he is. Oh. Nah, Oh, there goes my laptop. Hi, Baloo. Oh, he's mad at me. I'm sorry. Okay, well, this is Juniper, everybody. <laughs> Here's an angry cat. He's never coming back. He's like, fuck this green Yeah, room. he knows. Okay. Um, all right. Great anyway, time. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Moving on. Sorry, it was my fault. I saw a cat and yeah. just lost my mind. Well, I was about to go say something terrible, and then I heard kissing noises, and I was like, maybe I'll wait. Good. Yeah, I hope you all enjoyed that, because what's next is not great. Yeah, nothing else is going to be positive. Okay, so she gets this call and he's like, well, now is some time. Um, and she like, let's go out tomorrow. And she's like, okay, all right, you can pick me up and we'll go grab some pizza. Before they hang up, he tells her, I've been looking forward to this date for a very long time. Oh, she hangs up the phone and she's like, something is wrong. No, oh, yeah. She's yes. like, that tone in his voice was off. And like possessive I or Something. She just said there's like this tone that's just like, she said basically what she said was, um, let me find it. His tone immediately put me on edge. Something told me don't, <clears throat> excuse me, something told me don't go, don't go. Listen, listen to it. Chills. So the night of their date, the next day, instead of going home by seven to be picked up by Robert, Sarah decides to just stay at the gas station and continue her shift and work late. So she's decided to skip the date. She stays until about 9.30, figuring like, okay, he'll be gone by then. So everything's fine. She goes home, goes to bed. The next day, Sarah's at work when she spots Robert's truck pulling in. She mm. thinks, oh shit, like he's going to be pissed. And like, I didn't even call to explain what's going on. I totally stood him up. What she doesn't expect is that he's going to rev up his engine and drive his truck directly at her body. Oh my God. And that's exactly what he does. He charges his car at her, trying to run her over. She throws herself into the gas station doorway and like just escapes getting hit by this guy. So she turns around, jumps up, locks the freaking door become, before seconds later, he comes running and <gasps> slams his body against the glass door. Uh, he starts screaming at her, where the hell were you last night? Where the hell were you? He's absolutely losing his shit. She's yelling, calm down, Robert, I'm sorry. And he screams, sorry, I had plans. I made arrangements. She tries to tell him, you know, things got busy at work. I couldn't get away. I'm sorry. Just calm down and we'll talk about it. And he starts yelling, is it money you want, Sarah? And he starts throwing like bills at her. And he's like, you're, he, he calls her a whore and just starts throwing bills at her. And it's like, is this making you happy? Is this what you wanted? And he's like completely deranged. Like it is deeply upsetting to even watch the um, reenactment because like she's describing it this way and then he's like acting it out and it is disturbing as all get out. Finally, he just completely calms down. He looks her square in the eye and says, I went through a lot of trouble and you didn't show up. 
You selfish bitch, you ruined everything. Wow. So at this point, she's like, this guy is like completely off his rocker. He is a totally different person than the way he was like for the weeks before this. Um, not at all charming. She said his whole facial structure even looked different. Like he just turned into like- He totally pure... like dissociated into yeah. a whole other person. Right. She said he Ooh. like looked pure evil. Um, but so she's like, you know what? I got to keep my cool and like run this place basically. So she just tries to calm down and move on. Um, and the guy leaves and she's like, whatever, I'm just going to avoid him from now on. Oh, da -da 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 -da. <sighs> Great. Meanwhile, you guessed it, the pager messages are coming in more than ever. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And more violently than ever. Oh, I am sure and sad. Yes, also that. They say things like, I'm going to kill you slowly, piece by piece. <gasps> she said it was always sexual and it would always end with either dismembering her, stabbing her, or shooting her. He once also threatened to cut her eyes out. Oh my God. She didn't know who to tell at this point. She's like, you know, 19 years old. She's like, I thought about calling the police, but this is a small town. Like she didn't even know what to tell them. How could she say like, she didn't know, she, you couldn't trace the calls. Like there was just nothing she could think of to, to let them know. And at this point, like she really hasn't, this has been going on so long, she hasn't connected it to this guy. Right. You know, and it's seemingly now looking back, it's like, well, obviously, but like, you know, this guy has been like totally charming and disarming this whole time. And he had one like meltdown because she stood him up, but like she hadn't connected the two yet. Right. Um, so, da da da. Sarah starts having traumatic nightmares, as uh, Fair. I'm sure we all would. She said it felt like she was living in pure hell. And one night she's in her bed and her beeper goes off around two in the morning and she starts. This is terrible. She starts hearing these whimpering sounds. She says she can't tell if it's a human or an animal at first. And as she listens, she realizes it's a woman. <gasps> the woman begins screaming, sounding absolutely terrified and in pain. And as the beeper call progresses, it sounds like someone is being beaten on the other end of the line. Oh my God. One night around six months after Sherry's disappearance, Sarah's on the night shift and she's reading the newspaper and there's this article about missing young women throughout Las Vegas. And she's sitting there thinking of Sherry and it's just like, she doesn't know what to do. She feels totally helpless. All of a sudden the gas station phone rings. Sarah picks it up and it's her mother. Her okay. mother is completely frantic. She tells Sarah, I just got off the phone with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and they have linked you to a homicide. What? And she's like, mom, what are you talking about? She's like, don't even ask questions. Just get yourself to safety. Make sure the kids are safe. So she's like totally blindsided by this. She calls her friend um, and says, hey, get the kids locked inside. And as she's hanging up from that call, the phone rings again and this time it's the police department. A detective is calling to warn her that she's in danger and needs to be out of sight right now. Oh shit. She's like asking questions. He's like, I, we don't have time to give any more information. You need to get yourself to a safe place and we'll come to you. So she had this office in the back of the gas station. She locks herself inside and hides, not knowing what's going on until finally the police arrive and Sarah lets them in. They tell her that around 6 p.m. they found the body of her friend, Sherry Daniels, who had been missing this whole time. Oh no. Sherry had been dumped out in the desert. She had been raped and brutally murdered and they found her wallet at the scene. And when they opened her wallet, they found Sarah's name and home address inside the oh, wallet. no. So at this point, they're like, we gotta contact this woman and make sure she's safe. Yeah. Because there's clearly some connection here. So of course, this is already traumatic because she just found out one of her closest, her only like good friend in town has just been brutally murdered, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, but now suddenly she's tied to the case and is in danger. So they put Sarah into the squad car. They're like, lie down out of sight and they drive her to the police station. At the station, they basically pass over to her this big album of mugshots. They're like, okay, take your time, go through these photos and um, tell us if anything rings a bell. So she's looking through all these photos. She's like, hmm. And they say, do you know this man? And she's like, confused. She's like, which one? And they're like, no, that's all the same man. <gasps> in this mug what? album. So like, just like master of disguise? Yes. Oh my gosh. Isn't that fucking crazy? 
So he looks like completely different men and like di she said different races. Like he would like <gasps> change his hair and his facial hair, darken his skin. Like he could change like he looked Hispanic in one photo and then he looked like a pale white guy in another. Like just totally was able to manipulate the way he looked. Oh my God. So she's looking through these photos. She's like, I still don't totally know what's going on. Then she turns a page and sees Robert. And she's like, holy shit, that's him. That's Robert, the guy who freaked out at me at the gas station. And she, they're like, this is all him. All of these mug shots are that guy. Sorry, I can hear my phone. Oh, no, you're fine. It's my mother. <laughs> she knows. She knows. I mean, all I can see, her picture. I literally see, oh yeah, yeah. Her picture uh, for her contact ID in my phone is Lucille Bluth drinking a margarita while like her eyes like kind of like not there, like kind of just like rolling away. And so all I saw was Lucille Bluth Lucille's judging me. Her eyes just came from <laughs> underneath Em's laptop. Um, so she's turning the pages. She's like, that's Robert. Holy shit. And they're like, keep looking. And she's like, well, I already know like this is the same guy. And so she keeps looking through the pages and then she turns another pages. She realizes she, re she recognizes another man. Oh no. It's Andrew Ireland, <gasps> Jerry's boyfriend. And she's like, what? Realizing that's the same fucking guy that's been showing up at the gas station. Whoa, uh, you're right, Christine. This is blowing my mind. Fucking bananas, dude. Okay, so please tell Sarah, no, this isn't Robert Generoso, nor is it Andrew Ireland. His name is actually Stephen Peter Moran, and he has been murdering people since 1969. Oh my god. <sighs> wow. And on top of that, he was one of the most brutal and sadistic serial killers police had ever encountered. Uh, oh my god. They told Sarah he had beaten and raped Sherry several times, and suddenly Sarah realized that she had heard it happening <gasps> over her pager. <sighs> That's terrifying. Her quote at this point in the show was, I think he was killing my friend while he was beeping me. And she's just like crying. I mean, this is like oh decades my God. later, but it's just still... So I mean, I'm sure the sounds are still fresh in her head. Can you imagine that beeping must just be like the most traumatic sound? I mean, I can't... If you ever are near a pager again, like you're... <sighs> Just God. game over. Terrible. Um, anyway, yikes. So they tell her all this, what he's done to her friend Sherry, and then he, they say eventually he just shot her in the head and dumped her body. Oh my God. So they show her pictures of all the women he had murdered, and as she looked at them, she realized she was looking at all the same attacks, like violent things that he had been threatening her with over the pager. So dismemberment shooting he had even cut someone's eyes out like he had threatened to oh my god so these weren't even empty threats like these are things he was actually carrying out they knew of at least 44 women and seven men that he had murdered 44 oh my god and so uh police hadn't been able to track him in all that time most likely due to master disguise status um he was just ability he just had this ability to hide under different aliases and what he'd been doing apparently is taking names off of tombstones who were about the same age as him and then like calling in for their birth certificate and creating like false identities at these people. Wow. Uh, police tell Sarah she's in extreme danger and she starts to feel completely hopeless. Like, well, if they haven't caught him in all this time, how the hell are they going to catch him now? Um, they tell her, you need to get out of town. Like, is there anyone you can stay with? We don't have the resources in this town to like keep an eye on you at all times and you're not safe here. So the next day Sarah drops her kids off at the babysitters and says I'm just gonna run to the apartment to grab a couple things before getting the girls and heading out of town to my mom's place in Texas. Um, oh no sorry in Arizona. So she heads to her apartment with her friend Sally and uh, she's like I'm a she was afraid obviously she wanted someone there with her to like just bolster her right um, because she was so scared. So sure walking toward the apartment and suddenly Sally squeezes Sarah's hand and mouths the words, get in the car. <gasps> they run back to the car and just fucking peel out of there as quickly as possible. Once they get away, Sally looks at Sarah and says, he was in there, I heard him, he was behind the door as they were like walking up to the freaking apartment. Oh my God. So police search the house and lo and behold, there is a chair behind the door that was not there, that Sarah had not put there, that had been placed there strategically so he could sit and wait um of course police are like okay it's safe to go in now and look around and she's like i'd rather not it's like i never <laughs> want to go in the building again uh -uh. thank you so they accompany her in they she sees this chair behind the door that she had not put there uh based on the evidence he had been sitting in that chair waiting for her to walk through the door and had planned on shooting her <gasps> she bless you geo 
She looked at her end tables where her where she kept her address book, and he had been rifling through her address book. <gasps> oh no! So everyone yes. is potentially very unsafe. And the battery's about to die. <laughs> Great. Oops. Round four of technical difficulties. Okay. Yeah, we're not even recording on audio yet, but I did want to add. Um, whoops, the daisies. So sorry about that. The camera battery died. Oops. We'll work on it. Um, Can they hear us? If we're talking loud enough? Yeah. Right, cool. Oh, oh, you mean like connecting the audio? Yeah. Well, maybe. If not, I'll just delete it. Okay. If you can hear this. The battery died, so we've been sitting here for a while waiting for it to... Charge. Charge. Meanwhile, we ordered food. Yep. As we do whenever we have a dull moment. Exactly. Okay. My bad, everyone. Battery died. We're back. Okay. Woohoo! So, what was I saying? Something very frightening, I think. Yeah. Well, let's... Do you remember the note you lost? Not even a little bit. Hmm. Start with his name is Steven something. He was killing the girl, <laughs> Sherry. Oh, she, I thought you meant like from the beginning. I was like, mm, we don't have time for that. Uh, she was hiding in a closet. She found... Oh, she looked through the book, found out he's a master of disguise, found out oh, that whoa. he was probably murdering her, her friend. On the pager. On the whoa. pager. Then we were like, can you imagine even having oh, a pager? Oh, they went back to the house with Sally. And oh, yes. the chair was behind the door. Sorry. This is, I remember this because I started panicking because I saw the battery flashing and I was like, oh. Gotcha. Okay. So let's just start there. So let's start there. So they went back to the house and um, the chair, her chair was behind the door, meaning he had moved it to behind the door. She looked at her nightstand and her address book had been rifled through, meaning now he not only knew... Uh, everyone where that she lived but literally anywhere yes like anyone in her family anywhere she would possibly go anything from like doctors to bank to her mom's house her grandma's house like a anyone that he wants yeah he you know has access to exactly um so police tell sarah that stephen warren <clears throat> they believe is so obsessed with her that he will not stop until he got her so sarah's like great that's super for me and she takes her kids and heads to her mom's house in Arizona. So she feels a little bit safer, especially because police now set up like guard blocks on her street and she's at least with family sure. in a different state. But at the same time, like she can't leave the house even to take out the trash. Like she's completely you know, favored. And yeah, like she's trapped. basically imprisoned in her house and her kids are too. And she like doesn't know how to explain this to her kids. It's just very, very rough time. So one day uh, she's at her mom's house. It's around Christmas time and the phone rings. It's a familiar voice on the other end of the line. Okay. He says, I still know where you're at and I'm still gonna kill you. Oh my God. So he had found her at her mom's house and found her landline or had it in the address book, I guess, and um, had, had found her. So Sarah takes her kids and moves again, this time to her aunt's house in Texas. Um, and then in December, 1981, when she's finally at this point, like, I don't even know how I can live like this anymore. Sarah gets a call from police. They say they have finally arrested Stephen Peter Morin after a four-year FBI hunt. Wow. So that's how long it took even once the FBI <clears throat> got on board. Oh my gosh. They caught him trying to board a Greyhound bus, trying to get out of San Antonio, Texas, where he was wanted in another murder. Okay. This time of a woman named Carrie Marie Scott, whom he shot while attempting to abduct her in her work parking lot at the restaurant where she worked. Oh my God. His last victim... This is where she gets like weird in a totally different way. I don't even know. This wasn't in the episode. This is just like a totally different avenue I found on the internet that's like, what the hell is going on? Okay. So uh, his last victim was a woman named Margaret Palm, who according to thedarksideofamerica.com, spooky blog, yeah, uh, was abducted from a shopping center but at gunpoint, and then rode around with him in her car for 10 hours, allegedly converting him to Christianity in the process. Okay. Surprise! Okay. She played tapes of a Texas evangelist as, as she's driving him around, and read him quotes from the Bible. Finally, after 10 hours, he let her go, and, she, and he attempted to board a Greyhound bus, which is, again, where he was apprehended, and he willingly surrendered himself to police without resistance. Weird. Okay. So police speculated, though, when they talked to uh, Sarah, that he was in Texas because he was trying to track her down after she had moved to her aunt's house. Whew. So they were like, we think he's literally in the state to find you. So thank God they yeah. caught him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, once he was apprehended, Morin claimed he was a born-again Christian and a changed man. Because of 10 hours <laughs> in a car with someone he didn't kill for once. Yeah, exactly. For one time. Okay. Didn't murder. 
So the woman who drove around with him actually tells this story in like a sermon. Like I listened to it online. It's like on some website called like godiswithus.org or I don't know, another interesting blog. Sure. Um, but so she tells this whole like sermon um, back in the 90s and like how she's abducted again. It's very scary. And she's like, and then I just said, do you know Jesus? And he was like, no, and I don't want to. <laughs> Which the congregation laughed, so I feel I can laugh. Okay. Like she said it kind of jokingly, but she was like, yeah. So I talked to him, I read from my Bible, whatever, whatever. So Morin did plead guilty and confess to capital murder. Um, and he's actually the only the second person in Texas history to do so because it's essentially volunteering for the death penalty. So you're not like bargaining your way out of the death penalty. You're literally saying, nope, I did it and I'm going to die for it. Oh, okay. Willingly. Got it. Um, so his lawyer said, oh, he's a born again Christian. He's admitting to this because like he has changed his ways and blah, blah, blah. But born again or not, he chose to keep quiet on over 30 unsolved cases he was a suspect in Ooh. and did not allow anyone to get closure on those fronts. So Doesn't sound godly. Shouldn't, couldn't have felt that sorry for what he I did. don't think so. Um, yeah. So, da 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 Stephen, where are we? Stephen Peter Morin became the sixth person to be executed by lethal injection in Texas since the state began using lethal injections in 1982. Before his death, he gave the following statement as his last words. Let's hear it. Heavenly Father. Oh my god. <laughs> it just gets so much worse. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I give thanks for this time, for the time that we have been together in the last... 24 hours. <laughs> you and me, bud. To the end of the line. Uh -huh. I give thanks for this time, for the time that we have been together, the fellowship in your world, the Christian family presented to me. Uh, and then he called the names of the witnesses out okay. in this, like, as the family presented to him. Oh. Allow your Holy Spirit to flow as I know your love has been showered upon me. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm like... Oh Seriously? My God. That line you're gonna use? Jesus' line? Oh my God. You're being crucified? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Asshole. Forgive them, for they know not what they do, as I know that you have forgiven me, as I have forgiven them. Lord Jesus, I commit my soul to you, I praise you, and I thank you. Because of his heavy drug use, it took medics nearly 45 minutes to find a usable vein. Oh no. Again, this whole story has made me reconsider my, um... Needle fear? Desire to seek... Uh, hypnotherapy from my lovely therapist. Um, so it took them nearly 45 minutes to find a usable vein. They tried his arms and his legs multiple times before they could find anything through the scar tissue that would work. It's wow. just so disturbing. Um, Morin was pronounced dead at 12.55 a.m. on March 13th, 1985 at the age of 34. So 34 years old, he was already wanted and over. At 34, he's killed more people than the years he's lived. Exactly. Yikes. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> Chris, okay, so this is wild so there's this article i found in the guardian and it's this guy named chris clark and he actually writes how he was friends with morin but you know not in when he knew that what was right, going on right, 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 right. his mom actually dated him <gasps> and so he was like his stepdad for a long for a while for a few years wow and he talks about how close he was with this guy and he knew him as ray and he's like ray really like helped me and like got me a, my first job and they um bonded and became close oh that sucks yeah it's like really upsetting um and for what it's worth chris calls morin's last words quote his like you know christian statement so his like former stepson basically calls his last words quote a marvel of manipulative sociopathy oh Which I think is like the best yeah phrase concise and heard. perfect and accurate and completely um, he believes Morin was using his newfound Christianity in an attempt to manipulate any right-wing Texans who were part of the legal system who could have spared him. Right. Didn't work, obviously. Um, Chris's article talks about his relationship with uh, the guy he called the sick fuck and how he is still to this day grappling with the fact that he once helped Morin put carpeting in the back of his van, not knowing that Morin would later use this van to assault and murder oh my God. women in. Uh, Chris obviously still grapples with that to this day, especially because Morin once saved his life. Oh, well. So they were, uh, they had this painting job together, and once he was on this, um, ladder that began to slide over, and he was like, I was gonna die, like, this ladder, the, this ladder was going to slide off the wall, and I was gonna fall several stories to my death. And he remembers Ray, who, this, sorry, Morin had told them his name was Ray. And mm -hmm. actually, it was one of his disguises. Yes, exactly. 
Um, he remembers Ray helping him bring the ladder back to safety before steadying it and guiding him down. And this is the last line of the Guardian article. I thought it was just very poignant because he talks this whole time about like how much this guy like fucked him up and whatever. And so he says, and yet, and then this is the story. And I did it. I pulled back violently on the ladder and slammed it back into place. In reach of the window now, I helped Ray tie the ladder securely to the window frame as I sobbed in relief, then descended on increasingly shaky legs. Ray met me as I reached the bottom, grabbed me in a bear hug, kept me from slumping to the ground. Wow. And that is a story of serial killer Peter Morin, who's one of the most fucked up serial killers I've ever heard of and somehow hadn't heard of. That's a crazy story. I just like... And if you read the story online, there's nothing about Sarah who told the story on... So weird. You know, because like she hadn't told the like, story before. That's like, kind of like some of the excerpts I read for the Bridgewater Triangle, excuse me, the Bridgewater Triangle, I was like, how is this an only one source? Like, yeah. how is this not everywhere? Well, if you think about it, like, what, you know, she wouldn't have shared it before right. they interviewed her on That's the true. show. And once the, I mean, it's a recent show, so once the episode came out, people were like, oh, wow, there's this new side to the story. But, like, since he had murdered, you know, 44 women, like, those were the main points of conversation. Sure, yeah. Rather than, like, the person who wow. survived him. So, anyway, it's just a wild wild story and um i didn't even know i i was like watching this episode like this guy is such a creep and then i was like oh my god this is like a yeah. serial murderer for the ages Whew. who was apparently now in heaven so apparently allegedly well <laughs> or allegedly in hell who's to say <laughs> uh who's to say all right well that is great well Christine. let's see what the hell i did with the editing for this because wow i'm sure it's very questionable yeah um, if you're on this ride on YouTube, yep. thank you for bearing with us. Thank if you're you. on this ride just um, through your ears, probably... Well, hopefully we made it sound smooth and you didn't know all the chaos that has been happening. <laughs> tough, to, tough to say, though. Tough to say. If you want to see the chaos, you can find it on YouTube at youtube.com slash c... YouTube.com slash c slash and that's why we drink. You can also find our social medias, our Instagram and Twitter and uh, at ATWWD Podcast. Um, you can also, I don't know, you what You our Patreon at patreon.com slash, and that's where ATWWD podcast. We've got a website, and that's where drink.com, where you can find all of our tour dates. JK, we don't have them yet. Um, but, but once we do, they'll be there. But you can also look at merch and all kinds of nice stuff. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're rounding ourselves we're out. We're up. So, thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll be back with more spookiness next week. And that's why we drink. Ding!